I catch myself like in mm-hmm. appreciation for the time that we live that we, everything has kind of been reduced to everything is in, it's in one package like yeah I, for for people are enthusiasts whether it be whether it be a radio you can still buy a radio on Amazon you can still buy a CD player but I like the convenience mm-hmm. that comes with um even my phone <laughs> like there's a oh, yeah. there's a recorder on it there's mm-hmm. iTunes there's there's or Spotify there's a means I can listen to oh, yeah. the um, to music that I want to listen to I don't have to wait for a DJ oh, to yeah. put on that song so I, know, I catch right? myself in in a, in a state of really real like gratefulness or it's it's humbling when when you think about how it would have been fifty years ago, or even at the start of the century, and now we've yeah. got like nothing. You're talking. You were earlier. You were talking about the formats in which media has existed through um, laser disc, VHS, and now we're at this point where mm-hmm. everything is like invisible. It's it's non-existent. Like yeah, we're it's at just, that point where you could just uh, pretty much see it anywhere at any time, kind of thing at easy access. Yeah, like I, I, I have a great appreciation for that. There we go. But at the same time, it's like I, I like to have that nostalgic, you know. Of course. The the I guess I would say struggle, <laughs> like. I don't know. For part of me likes to have that luxury, but at the same time, there's moments throw it away where I'm like, you know, it's interesting having to dig around for that one song in my record player, and then put it on the r- turntable. You know, yes. it's just that you get that feeling of how it was. Like, I I know that there were probably people out there with large record uh, collections where they dig through like. 100 uh, records just to listen to one song, you know? Um, and I mean, man, DJs back in the day, like, y- you might laugh, but I'm talking about like 10 or 11 feet of just wax vinyls. Really? Like, we're talking like the 30, like the 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and early mid 60s. Like, it wasn't uncommon for a DJ to have four or five turntables in a row and like one vinyl then the next and then the next and uh if somebody in the room across from you is brought like getting ready to do a live like in the 40s they would all gather around a microphone to do a live read off a sheet the advertisement over radio or like do a show uh like the lone ranger or whatever and then the DJ, four, five records in a row, one after the next, you know? And sometimes they would have this thing to pause the song so they can talk about the last song they played uh, or a song coming up. And I always find it fascinating when I see pictures. I've seen pictures of where they have like eight or nine, even ten feet just stacked of records of like what they're going to be playing that day. And a day for them was like 36 hours. Like some of the DJs back then, they ran on coffee and pure adrenaline, a lot of them. Like a 36-hour straight shift. Wow. Like it wasn't uncommon. It was just like, damn. You know, it's like, how does one do that? But now, nowadays, it's very easy because you just have iPod, you just scroll with your finger, click song with your finger, and it plays. You know, it's very... It, it's the contrast between the two. It's very interesting to see how things have developed. Absolutely. Uh, you know? Like, it, uh, the, uh, society has come quite a, quite a far away from uh, how it was. Uh, yeah. Just, just insane. Um, I do, I do have an iPod myself. 
Uh, hey. What's a thousand or so songs? I know, right? A thousand uh, songs in your pocket. You can listen to any I know, right? time. I know, right? <laughs> or just like if I want to, I can hook it up to that Bluetooth speaker and just like, oh man. Dude, I, a few days ago, I was in the middle of a laundry mat. Uh, like, okay, I was out on a walk and my dog peed all over his leash and I quickly needed to wash it because it was stinking. And I was taking him on a walk, so I quickly went to a laundry mat just to quickly, you know, wash it. And he was sitting in my lap. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to play a song. And I just had my Bluetooth speaker, which was a little thing. <laughs> and I never got to hear Di Woody's <laughs> laundry mat. <laughs> oh, my God. Because oh. uh, I didn't have my earbuds, I'd forgotten them. And I had my Lucy speaker just by mere chance. And I was like, you know what? Grandma over there, you're getting a blast to the 80s. You know, just... And she looked over at me, she, she said, who's that singing? singing? I said, it's the Die Woodies. Uh, and it's... She's like, oh, okay. What's she singing? <laughs> and I was like, I was like, it's two guys, it's two guys singing it's... in German. <laughs> she said, "Oh, okay, I thought it was uh, Dutch." And I was like, "No, no, it's not a Dutch one singing." Uh, it was great, but she liked it. Oh. She liked it, and she asked me to write it down for her. And she had to have been at least in her sixties. Like, it was. It was. I don't know. It, it was interesting because I was just waiting there. I threw his uh, lead into the dryer, and he was just sitting there on my lap dryer, just <laughs> staring at her. I, I think I'd mentioned he was a rescue dog. He, every time she moved or coughed, he just growled at her. <laughs> uh, man. It's, it's, it's great. Heck yeah. Oh, man. Now, was this an uh, iPod yeah. Classic, or was it... What kind of iPod was it? N Nano. Ah, na the Nano had Bluetooth capabilities? I Wait, mm -hmm. oh, it's the, the touchscreen Nano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I got that as a graduation gift from high school. Hey, nice. Um, we were, Okay, I would, like I had mentioned before, I was on the high school wrestling team. We were all going to go to graduation our singlets, but I thought, you know what? No, <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. And uh, my friend Tyler, he he was the only one who actually did it. <laughs> and, and everyone's like, "Now nah, we're not gonna do it." And we assumed he got the memo, and he showed up <laughs> in his wrestling gear. <laughs> and I was like, "Dude, you need to get something on because we said we weren't gonna do it." He said that he slept like he's like, dude, I slept in. I didn't even get that message, and I was like, uh, so literally he went and quickly got into a suit at his house. Luckily, he didn't live too far from there. We didn't do the uh, graduation ceremony at school. We did it at the uh, local uh, movie theater. Oh, and we just there was a stage. Yeah, it was a weird. It, okay, back in the day, it used to be like. Uh, vaudeville, like used to do vaudeville, yeah, and then they converted it to a, a movie theater in the 40s. Uh, they used, they called it the Capitol Theater, uh, it was made, I think, 1913 or so. And they used to do vaudeville acts, and then in the 30s, they converted it to a movie theater, so it still has a stage. So we would come out from behind the movie screen area, and we were going up, you know the shake the principal's hand get the thing walk off the other side of the stage <laughs> I luckily he didn't live too far from there because that would have been funny if he walked out in his <laughs> just like mm. <laughs> you know but that that would have been classy um the history that some was... buildings have I know right man uh, it, it's just like you know, I'm, if that stage could talk, I the amount of stuff that 
like acts and stuff that would have been on there. You know what vaudeville is, right? It's like a independent theater almost, right? Uh, kinda. It it was um they they'd have different things like back then the the sense of humor was really di different from now. Oh, definitely. Uh, they don't have the kind of uh, people would rip a gut to uh, why the chicken cross the road. Oh my! Like they rip guts to that. <laughs> Whereas now we're just like, huh? The, the 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 dad jokes of back then got everyone laughing, but it's like, and then they'd have singing acts, um, and sometimes dance, uh, tap dancing, what have you, um. <laughs> and it's just like sometimes like animal uh, performances like dancing jumping dogs or whatever that's pretty much what vaudeville uh, was just uh, local uh, entertainment um, but yeah it man the like I don't even think they do. I think they might do vaudeville still in like some parts of the U.S. or Canada, but I haven't seen any. Uh, huh. But yeah, it, it's interesting how they used to do that back then. That um, thing you just said about animals, I don't know if that would fly nowadays. Because there, and and thank goodness for awareness, but. <laughs> Is that animal being taken care of? Is it being fed? Is oh, it yeah. getting its um, medications and stuff? Oh, I know, right? Ah, oh, man. I think the last show to do animal performances at a great scale, I'd like to say it was the Ed Sullivan Show. Do you know what that show is? Are you Are you familiar with that? I think I've come across a few clips of it on YouTube as well as the Wikipedia page. I it's I I like YouTube. I like Wikipedia. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> where I Oh yeah. It's where I find things in passing, but Edward Sullivan. Yes. Uh yeah, the Ed Sullivan show like it started in the 50s and went all the way up until the 80s. Like oh, it had I know, right? Um and I think it was the late 80s, no, early or late 80s, so sometime in the 80s that the show ended, uh, obviously, because he'd passed on. But, uh, man, it's just, like, he had all kinds of shows. He had foreign choirs, performing bears. Yes, I've seen an episode where he had performing bears. Wow. I'm not even kidding. Yeah, he had performing giraffes, walruses, seals, monkeys, dogs, cats, uh, co comedians, singers of all kinds of different shapes and forms, uh, all over the world even, uh, circus stuff uh, right on his stage. Uh, actually, the Beatles, when they came to America, that they were first on the Ed Sullivan show. <laughs> that was where they first went. Yeah. He had beetles, both the band um, and the animal. Yeah. Well, actually, <laughs> Bad joke. don't laugh. They they actually, uh, no, you're not wrong, though. They did have performing ants on the oh. Ed Sullivan <laughs> show back in 1962. Performing yeah, ants. Yeah, a guy would, yeah, basically he would have them march in a row and up different obstacles. Yeah. Wow. In a row. I don't know how that guy did it. I forget his name, but it was in the early 60s. He he was on a few times, and he would just have this stick of some sort, and they would follow it in a row all the way up different obstacles, through obstacles, and they would just follow it around on this little table. Um, yeah, it was it was just insane. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, no, but the performing bears, like... <laughs> you, you figure that's just something you hear about in the circus, but no, like I've seen it in the mid '60s. Like, uh, and I think it was a colored video. He, he had like bears that were in uh, tutus and like human clothes, and they were like doing different uh, 
dance, like jumping and through serving hoops and coffee, stuff. doing backflips. Oh, serving coffee, I wish. I did see one um, in a little car, like it was a cub, uh -huh. in a little motor car thing, like a like a toy car kind of thing, and just going around <laughs> in that. It was funny. Um, one of the most interesting um, people, I'd say comedians for sure, to be on the Ed Sullivan Show. Are you are you familiar with uh, Richard Pryor? Of course. Oh my goodness, yes. Um, my he was on the Ed Sullivan Show. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What a what a what a force of nature, Richard Pryor. I know, right? It, he did a. He did one in the 69 or 1970 on the Ed Sullivan Show. It was a uh, comedy uh, skit that he did uh, called The Black Man for President. Wow. And it was just basically him saying, like, how, you know, if he was president, <laughs> or, uh, you know, what it would be like. And I don't know who was in office at that time, but it was it was funny. Wow. You know. Yeah, Richard, like he took the moment. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Richard Pryor was awesome and inspired a lot of comedians. Uh, Eddie Murphy, uh, Bill yep. Burr, to name a few. Uh, but really, mm -hmm. his stuff, his stuff's great. Oh, it is. Uh, I've seen a lot of stuff that he was in that was pretty good. I have you ever seen the movie The Toy? No, I I know he was in Superman, uh, two. Yes, uh, Superman. Was it two or three? I think I was on the Wikipedia page. What was it? Two. It probably was two. I'm not sure, but I know he was in one of them. Uh, you, you, you'd you like that. Uh, Richard Pry was in uh, the movie uh, The Toy with Jackie Gleason. Okay. Um, really funny movie. Uh, he was also in a movie with Gene Wilder, and there was a video essay online that was talking about how Gene Wilder has this naturalistic way of going about things. I'm, I'm going to butcher this if someone does find the video, but I know, right? This movie, I forgot the, what the movie was, but it featured Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor. And from this video essay, it was showing that both personalities, even though they contrasted on screen, well, he was talking mm -hmm. about how their contrasting performances actually made the movie the the performance now they were there i think they were friends off stage but richard pryor and gene wilder would oh, continue yeah. to make more movies and just the chemistry that people have is it really one are you referring to fire. blazing saddles not blazing saddles Oh, okay. Was Richard Pryor huh. in Blazing Saddles? I think so. He may have made Very a briefly. Yeah, but, yeah, Richard Pryor. Rest in peace. Yeah. Man, he was he was something else. I'm trying to think of... Uh... Eddie Murphy's another... Have you seen Eddie Murphy's stand-up? Stand it is... Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is phenomenal. He oh, is man. hilarious. Raw is, and I think uh, Delirious are probably are monumental. They're 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 great. I I was oh, there yeah. was a phase in uh, 2020 where I had this obsession like with comedians, and it's it's an interesting mm -hmm. job making people laugh because especially in today's climate, we we need people to to make us laugh. Oh yeah, like uh, that reminds me a uh, famous quote from a movie. Uh, um, it was said by Roger Rabbit of all people. He said, so, "You know, Eddie, the most powerful thing in the world sometimes can be laughter. Absolutely. Sometimes making somebody laugh can be the most powerful weapon there is, and that that that's so true. You know, absolutely. Like it it's." We live in a society where laughter can be very important. I agree. And 
I uh, I think some people don't get enough of it. Um, Agreed. In their life. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, that because that reminds me. Richard, by the way, I I don't think it was in uh, Blazing Saddles. I I don't mean to divert back, but I, it's gonna bother me. You're good. Are you thinking of See No Evil, Hear No Evil? Was it a comedy? Because special, that was one. Or was it with? Uh... It was a movie uh, with him, Jane Gene Wilder, and Richard Pryor. That I think that was the one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm, I'm looking at it, I'm like, is this the one? Because they weren't in many movies together, I don't think. But okay. I know that they were both in that one. Um, Richard Pryor. Uh, one movie I liked that he was in with uh, Eddie Murphy uh, was Harlem Nights. All right. If you've ever, se- if you've never seen that, I highly recommend. I'll even watch it with you. It's an amazing movie. It I'll has uh, offer. those two. Oh yeah, it has those two. I don't know if you know who it is, but Red Fox. Do you know who that is? I'll have to do some research. Uh, he did an amazing TV show in the seventies uh, called uh, Sanford and Son. Okay. Man, that was hilarious. Oh uh, man, uh, I could go on for hours about Sanford and Son. That was an amazing show. Um, but no, he's in that movie. And so you've heard of Della Reese, the mu- musician. You got me there. Uh, she was a musician in the 60s, uh, but she's in that movie as well. Um, but yeah, Richard Pryor in the movie plays Eddie Murphy's dad. So, wow. you know, uh, yeah, it's a really good movie. I highly recommend. Um, man. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a good movie. Maybe I'm trying to think. so uh, much. You're, you're well cultured, mm-hmm. and from not just from contemporary times, but from history. You know times and places and people. You are a very well versed individual. Was well, thank you. At what was the earliest um? Do you re- do you recall your earliest? Um, point where you realized, okay, this is, when did the passion begin for this search and, um, for this passion for history? Do you know where, um, came Ah, from? It's funny you bring that up. Uh, okay. So when I was eight years old, right, I don't know why, but. I suddenly, I can't really explain it myself, but I suddenly had this interest in music from the 40s. Have I heard it? Had I heard it before, really? Not really. And I don't know why, but all of a sudden I just had this feeling of like wanting to listen to that sort of music. And I couldn't really explain it. And my brother and my mom were talking at, this is when i was young obviously and they were talking in the kitchen and they were discussing me i wasn't really paying attention uh but i because i was in the other room playing my at 64 and my brother was like oh no no he doesn't like grandpa's music my grandfather uh i believe i heard one song from back then and I just got hooked on it from eight onwards, and it just kind of unraveled from there. But it's funny, uh, the story behind it, it's I'd heard it, and since then I just didn't want to listen to anything but that at the time. And my brother was like, oh, no, no, he likes the Backstreet Boys. And because like, <laughs> that was what was, like, really popular. And, oh, no, he likes Shady. Mind you, I, mind you, I did like Shady and, and uh, some Backstreet Boys uh, stuff at the time. Uh, but it wasn't my go-to right and it's just like my mom was like no no uh no he likes uh glenn miller and the andrew sisters he's like oh come on he doesn't like grandpa's music so they took me to walmart and my brother uh, had a 
a school job, right? And he's like, I will tell you what. We'll take uh, Mitch to the CD aisle in Walmart, and he can pick whatever CD he wants. And if I win, you pay for the CD, Mom. And if I, if you win, I'll pay for it. So <laughs> my brother told me to go into the Walmart uh, with them. So I did, and they said, you can pick out any CD you like. And my dad was at work at the time, right? So um, we, we, the three of us went in, and I went down the aisle, looked up and down the CDs for about 20 minutes or so. I remember very clearly. And I just picked out Glenn Miller. Hey. Brought it up. <laughs> and my brother was shocked. My mom already knew what I was going to pick roughly, but I heard the song once and I just, it, it kind of raveled into the interest of history. Yeah. Because it, uh, based off that, I'd heard the song once and it just kind of raveled into that. And it was just, they were different times, like the, the history in the 30s and 40s. Yeah. Uh, like I'm only 27 and it's just like the, the automobiles, like the radios, the clothing style, uh, the cartoons, movies, uh, the lingo even, uh, it just, it was so simplified yet at the same time, there was things were very wholesome and very straightforward into the point with things like films i've noticed like for me at least like acting is good nowadays it really is uh like even if they don't feel the emotions you can see it but for me at least in my opinion some of the films from back in the 30s and 40s a lot of the actors and actresses they talk about forcing themselves to feel those emotions whereas not pretending to yeah and wow. and so there was like a bit of a study done that if they wanted to feel angry, sad for the part, they would remember something that made them feel those emotions yes. to project those emotions. Yes. And uh, John Ford, if you know that uh, director, he was uh, one of the people who really pressed that idea of not pretending to feel the emotions that if you have to play a role where you're very mad and angry, remember something that made you angry, whether somebody ran over your toe, somebody uh, took your lawn gnome. And he actually said that in the interview uh, that I was watching. Like, I was like, you know, that pretty much is how I feel. Like, a lot of people back then, they just really forced themselves to feel these emotions. Absolutely. Um, the best they could. Uh, acting nowadays is great. I love it. Like, we watched uh, Sonic 2 just a few days ago. Heck the yeah. acting was phenomenal. But for me, at least, I could tell to a point that it just kind of seemed forced, the emotions. They didn't seem as genuine. But maybe that's just uh, my perspective. It's okay. a little biased. But, of course, but, of course. Uh, but, but, uh, yeah, um, one movie that you've heard of, um, It's a Wonderful Life, 1946, right? <sighs> the, I need to see that movie. I've held off that movie for a while. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to watch the movie. The movies that have been putting on off hold, I'm starting to watch. Like The Breakfast <laughs> Club, I finally saw... Um, which other movie I know, right? did I see? It'll come to me. But I've been meaning to watch The Goonies, and I've been meaning to watch... Hey. It's a, it's a, yes, those movies. Yes, those movies that people quote all the I know, time. Right? I'm finally getting around to, and I will I know, watch right? uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, um, Miyazaki films. Mm -hmm. I, I finally started watching those, well, oh, nine, yeah. month, nine months ago, but you get the mm -hmm. idea. It's a wonderful life, but oh, yeah. talking about the acting and encouraging the individuals to really search not just their emotions, but their experiences. 
this is actually psychology because how I remember things is how I felt at that time. And mm -hmm. I agree with you because sometimes I, I lose my phone all the time. But while I'm while I have my phone or while I have something, there's a good time there's a good chance I'm also carrying an emotion with me, usually remembering something. And whenever mm -hmm. I lose something, in addition to tracing my steps back, tracing my emotions back, because I feel that <laughs> remembering how you felt um, takes you back um, to where you were. But I digress. It's a wonderful life. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Need to see it. Yeah, it's, that... it's been I've been putting it off yeah. all too long. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, uh, if you remember, uh, uh, December-ish, uh, when Christmas comes around, we, sh we should definitely watch it. I've seen it both black and white and colorized. There's a colorized version? But... Mm-hmm. I did not know. Yeah, it, uh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, the, the one scene towards the end, I always tear up and cry because I can feel the emotions that Jimmy Stewart, he... I've seen. I have behind the scenes uh, because I really like the movie. And uh, on the DVD, I have. He was remembering his mother at the time that they were doing that scene, and him crying. Like man, he just seeps those emotions. Like I, I can feel it through the screen, kind of thing. I know that sounds, uh, maybe cliche, but it's like man, like he was leaking those emotions, like in that scene. It was the scene, uh, well, I won't go into great detail because I know you haven't seen it, but it was right towards the end uh, when they were singing uh, Auld Lang Syne. It was just like, holy moly. It's just like the emotions, like he's just seeping. And and in the uh, behind the scenes, he had mentioned at that moment to get those joyous and sad emotion mixed. He thought of his mother, and that's just like, damn, you know, it's like that, that, like, being able to do that as an actor or actress, bringing forward those sort of emotions can really bring a movie to life, you know, and make it a good movie. Sure, the acting or what's said in them uh, are the context of the movie, the content, sure, that all helps, but if an actor or an actress cannot portray the emotions properly. It it just seems forced and like you're reading off a page, you know? Like it just doesn't bring it out like forward, you know, like Absolutely. you know what I'm saying? I, like, I, I agree. I think there's a difference in an act now, acting is acting and there are people that are excellent at it, but I do believe there's a difference between reading from the script and then reading and this this is going to be a little controversial projecting your yeah self as this character like understanding yeah. where this character is coming from absolutely mm -hmm. uh, yeah like putting yourself in the position of that character and leaking your emotions into that character, like, it really drives it home. Of course, there are movies out there where they really don't need emotions. Um, and it kind of loops back to what we were first talking about, but a good movie example, uh, this movie was actually pulled out of theaters, the one I'm about to talk about, within the first week, from, oh. uh, within the first week, they pulled it right out of theaters. And they canceled it all across movie theaters. Uh, and they banned it from being played in the theaters. Whoa. And it's it, it was considered a B movie. Uh, it came out in the 80s. Do you know what movie it is before I tell you? You got me there. We need to watch it, by the way. Uh, if you're not queasy, do you usually get queasy? You know, I'm selective with what I watch. Um, that That's just... It's amazing. not like gore. Okay. It's um, Garbage Pail Kids. It was pulled out of theaters within the first week. 
uh, and it was because people were vomiting in the theaters, <laughs> women and children. Oh my uh, goodness. Yeah, it when it came out in theaters within the first week people were like oh, okay well maybe this is like a new musical or a kids <laughs> movie you know it, it, it wasn't geared towards kids uh and the kids like there were okay the, the whole thing about garbage pail kids it it was a spoof of the cabbage patch yeah kids. yeah and uh the the part that most people got up out of the theater after feeling nauseous was don't, don't. Peter Pim. I was gonna okay yeah I want to be spoiled I want to be surprised I want to watch the movie like okay, oh like... so that's what he like feel <laughs> <laughs> so no spoilers oh, man okay I, I, yeah uh, we'll watch it though. no 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 worries. But we should I, watch it this weekend. My tendency is the less I know about a movie, the more I am inclined to watch it. So, <laughs> oh yeah, the musical was great though. There was a like musical. it was like it was technically no it was te well they the characters in the movie sang songs. It was like <laughs> sort of in the same genre as a little shop of horrors. Yeah, like the remake classic. of course. The well the eighties one was technically a remake, but uh, um. But yeah, like it was like that kind of like level of like musical, like they they'd be talking or whatever, and then suddenly break into song. <laughs> it was like that. <laughs> I actually had seen, and it's it's astounding. Like they didn't even need to do proper acting for like a movie <laughs> like that, like Garbage Pail Kids. It was just you had to pretty much, I guess, just. Like, it's one of those movies where you didn't really have to put much emotion into it. Yeah. It, it bad, well, not bad, it's a great example. Basically, it was just had to, like, look scared or look shocked, grossed out or whatever, and people bought it. Uh, I think there was only, like, thir I think it was something crazy, like 35% of people stayed in the theaters right to the end of the movie <laughs> wow <laughs> and yeah and it's crazy because after the movie came out it was still a b movie but people had to buy more of the cards like the cards came out before the movie did and they had yeah. to buy more cards buy the lunchbox yeah like yeah. the vinyl record it's like <laughs> it's just like the what, holiday what? vinyl yeah. Oh my! Don't laugh. There was a Christmas album. I, the Christmas album. That's what it's called. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The garbage Pill Christmas hits. Yeah. It's actually a thing. Uh, in 1989, they actually came up with an album. <laughs> <laughs> you, you oh have to have man! That. <laughs> and then I know, right? I'll the disappointment you that you get when you're like, "Hey, Dad!" After, um. What's his face? Um, Who? Uh, Christmas singer. After Frank Sinatra is, hey, Dad, can we put on uh, Garbage Pill Kids? And that falls. Sure. It's <laughs> just like, right oh, at, my right God. After, <laughs> oh, this stack of CDs. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Um. Uh, there was one song on the on the, on that called Booger Bells. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Oh my goodness! Yeah. <laughs> uh, just, just and then like, it begs why? the question: the writers and the people in the studio, like just uh, like oh, I, 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 I can't, I, Josh. I don't know if I want to do this anymore, Jacob. Yeah, no, right? You made like... a commitment. You signed a contract. <laughs> Sing the song. <laughs> it's just like, the, what, what brings one to do that? You know, like, uh, one of the songs I'll admit it, it was catchy. Emotions. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> oh, my God. This, 
I'll admit it, one of the songs, it was catchy. I'll admit that in the movie. But aside from that, like, I've watched that. It's like, what am I watching? <laughs> like, oh, man. This, like, it, it was about as good as uh, Killer Cla- uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space, like that 80s hey, movie. Yeah. Have you seen that? I, I need to. <laughs> It's I, I one of those cliches. It. Yeah. Oh, man. Some of the 80s horror movies, I love them. I, like, they, they ended up being like, what am I watching? Uh, like, Killer Tomatoes, the attack of the Killer Tomatoes, like, that, Critters. The first Critters, it was like, what am I watching here? It's just like, you know, uh, some of them, it was, it, it was just insane. Um, I'm trying to think of another one. My that favorite, was just... um, wacky mm-hmm. B, a B rated movie, shock treatment from yours truly, I... Richard O'Brien, who also did the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Now people say, well, I don't know if people say, but. The Rocky Horror Show is a cult classic. So, oh yeah. There's this level of fandom and then there's like, okay, it's a cult classic. The movie I'm about to tell you has an even smaller but cult um following with yours truly also being a fan, Shock Treatment. Now, this mm-hmm. is a very unpopular opinion what I'm about to say, but I prefer Shock Treatment oh, yeah. over the Rocky Horror Picture Show. For its campiness right. and in the movie, you, there are songs and I don't know. There's something about it that just seems genuine. That that just that it feels like I I can't explain it. Like they had fun right. despite the low budget, but it's yeah. It was. I've, it, I've not seen shock treatment. It per, I feel that this movie predicted modern television because i i don't know how television was in, in terms of interviews and peeking into personal lives but the premise of this movie is that you have these two lovebirds who are who attend a show and they're they're pulled from the audience and they are the new they're the new stars mm-hmm. of this live show so it's it's all on set and their personal lives are just being monitored like almost voyeuristic voyeurism i don't know the word but i feel that okay. this movie kind of predicted the future in which now everything about a celebrity is exposed is is out in the open or it we don't even have to go to celebrity i think our personal um lives are now in public mm-hmm. and i feel that this movie kind of captured that for the time that it was made i don't know if it predicted um streaming sorry, well I, I kind of digress but it's that exploitive nature that these people are still living lives but that's that was the message that oh, yeah. i got from shock treatment b movie you may like it you may hate it i love it but it's it's fantastic yeah Oh yeah, it, it. I mean, they sort of do exploiting nowadays. Absolutely. Look at Doctor Phil. Look at Jerry Springer. Yeah, I like movies that have um longevity to them, where ah, years yes. after they are released, you can look back and find some parallel from the time it was made to modern times. I think to me, those movies. I find them valuable. Oh yeah, it's just like I, I I've seen movies like that before. Uh, it's just like B movies that last because of their cult classicness, the security and low budget in them is just I would last. Time itself. Everyone knows of Indiana Jones, but heck yeah. What about 
killer clowns from outer space. That right. will always live. You know? Sure, you can make a yes. hundred thousand uh, Indiana Jones, but there will only ever be one killer clowns from outer space. They've never touched that since then. You know? It's like um, one... Okay, they made a series of three movies. Uh, you, you've probably seen them. If not, we should see them. Um, have you seen the Bruce Campbell uh, three movies, Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, and Army of Darkness? I've seen the first one. So, <laughs> finally a movie I've seen. Evil Dead? I saw Evil uh, Dead. Sadly. And we need to... Yes. Um, classic. Um, I know, right? Oh, man. The second one and the third one, Army of Darkness. I will fight anyone over that. Army of Darkness. That, that my friend, is gold. You when okay when Ash <laughs> smashes a skeleton, you can see the plastic bones just fl fl flying by him. Wow! Like they, they they don't even hide it in the third one. They want you to see that the like the first one was meant to be serious. Then they were like. Eh, Sam Raimi was like, you know, nah, eh, no, it, it, it was semi-serious, but comedic at the same time. And then the third one, he was like, do we really need to hide the plastic skeletons anymore? <laughs> do we, do we really need to? It's like, and he just didn't hide it. And like, Man, and the TV show that he came out with, Sam Ramey, like, that was amazing, too. If you've never seen the TV show, highly recommend. It It is amazing. How does it go um, to it's the, called Ash versus the Evil Dead? Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah, versus, Ash versus Evil Dead. It it was really good, actually. Uh, it, it holds up fairly well, and it keeps true to the uh, first three movies. Like, it's like... If they were going to make a fourth movie, it would have been that TV series. That's how good it is. Wow. Like, they constantly make references and show representations of the first three movies. And they kept the original cabin oh, wow. from the first two movies. Yeah. They, like, it's an actual house, uh, Chroma. That, uh, somebody <laughs> lent that to Sam Ramy. Wow. For the first two movies, and then the TV show. Well, the third movie as well, Army of Darkness. But it's just like, man. And even like the small characters in the first and second one, it's like those characters. You, like in the first one, the hillbilly, you remember him with the overalls? Yeah. In the TV show, they make few references back to him. That cliche guy that was in there for only a short period of time. Wow. You know, like they did pay really close attention to detail and bring everything full circle to, for full circle to life. You know? And it's just like man. It's it's amazing. Like they've even made video games uh on Steam. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think there's one that they're going to be adding to Steam, but right now it's not on Steam. It's called uh, The Evil Dead or something, and it has Ash Williams you can play as. Fascinating, fascinating. Wow. It's always you know, good to like, see works that, like, pay attention to de well, that give, that build off the original universe. Yeah, it's like Yeah, it's like it's one of those movies where it's like man the circumstances made the uh, product. It, yeah, yeah, it's just like just a low budget. It's like it's weird because it's just made the movie, you know? It's like... Yeah. So, yeah, like, um, I'm trying to think of the, um, the thing, um, 
Um, another movie that I think you'd like is, uh, if you've not already seen it, uh, The uh, Critters. Have you seen Critters? You know, I've seen the poster, and it's like these little figures with like sharp teeth and like red eyes. I'm like, this looks like... <laughs> It was a B movie classic. <laughs> they made a second one, right? And a third and a fourth. Wow. The, the second one was uh good. Uh third one was me. The fourth one was no. Just no. It was the same thing with the movie Leprechaun. After the first two, it was like what are you doing here? Come on. And then the number four was, I just, I watched it, but it was like. It just didn't hit. Yeah, it was like, what are you doing here? It was called Leprechaun from Outer Space. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> come on. There was Leprechaun, Leprechaun 2, Leprechaun 3, and then Leprechaun from Outer Space. I mean, like, come on, you're reaching there. I want to time travel and be invisible to the time they gave the title reveal where they were at a table like this. Everyone had their own stapled um, copy to read the script, a script reading, and they pick up the script and they read Leprechaun 4, Leprechauns from Outer Space, and the control they must have had when they put it down. And like, it's just really? Like, <laughs> like, yeah, it's just like... <laughs> I the the uh, the only thing I liked about the fourth one was the references to the old John Wayne Western movies. There was one scene in Leprechaun Four that I could even consider to remember. Uh, but Andy, I don't know how he did it. He did an amazing like. Okay, you know who played Leprechaun, right? You got me there. Okay, have you seen the movie Willow? Okay. In the 80s? Remember the main character, the small uh, uh, midget man the, the with the long hair? Okay. Like, he played the leprechaun in the movies. The guy who played Willow in the movie? Yeah, he played the leprechaun. And the, he, when he had John Wayne's voice, it was... Holy moly, it was like, is this? <laughs> John Wayne. I know, right? He, John Wayne. Have you ever seen a John Wayne movie? I don't think so. I've been meaning to. There's, I have this back. We should watch of, one. We will. I've been meaning 50 to watch 50 movies or more. <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> the good, the bad. No, that's Clint Eastwood, or is that John Wayne? That's Clint Eastwood. Clint no, Eastwood. that's Clint Eastwood. Okay. Um, a fistful of dollars. Is that Clint Eastwood or John Wayne? That's Clint Eastwood. Okay. Uh, and then the, he did a sequel called A Fist uh, for a Few Dollars Mo More. Oh wow! That was a sequel to A Fistful of Dollars. Yeah. Wow. What what what's the what's the What's the landmark film that John Wayne starred in? I should know this. I should know at least a few films. Um, I'm, I'm turning up he, blank right now. I embarrass myself. No, no, don't. No worries. Um, I'd have to say the movie that he's he got an Academy Award for. Uh, but he, in my opinion, he should have got him for quite a few more movies, but. The movie that he is most remembered for is True Grit, the original True 1969 Grit. movie, True Grit, with him and Glenn Campbell. That's right. True Grit. Haven't seen did it. Did you know who was offered that uh, uh, before Glenn Campbell? Did you know who was offered that uh, role? Who? Elvis Presley, but he turned it down because John Wayne's name was going to be for appearing first in the opening credits. Elvis Presley. He turned it down, so Glenn Campbell took it. 
Elvis Presley has his own imp- impressive catalog of movies that he starred in as well. I, yeah, some of them were really good, but for me, I some of the singing beach movies were kind of <laughs> like it was like kind of mm-hmm. it's like the one movie that I just couldn't sit down and enjoy was his 1962 movie Kissing Cousins. Oh my goodness, that that title did not age well. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what it's about. Goodness gracious. Wow. Presley, yeah, why? Yeah. Why you do this? Why do you do this? <laughs> the only movie that I liked, and ironically he didn't sing in the movie at all, huh. was a Western. Oh. And he actually he, he was really, really good in it. It was called Chiro. Okay. Really good uh, Western movie. I'll check it it out. takes place uh, just post Civil War, like 1866, like the war had just ended, the U.S. Civil War. And he plays uh, a guy who was a former Confederate artillery man. Yeah. And he just wants to move on and live his life. But his old unit keeps trying to get him to go back and, <laughs> you know fight on and he just wants to say he's like no <laughs> it's actually a really good movie a really good movie Chiro. um my favorite yeah it's spelled c-h-a-r-o gotcha uh really really good movie um he did a few movies that were kind of eh? but Shiro, like two thumbs up and ironically, that came out the same year uh, as True Grit, 1969. Wow. As a matter of fact, I think as soon as you turned down... <laughs> Chroma. Chroma. The 60s Chroma. were real. They're real. Phenomenal yeah. time for movies. I was just thinking about... I'm, I'm going to get corrected here. Uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Oh, yeah. And... What? The other movies. The sixties were uh, a great yeah. time for movies. I think Vertigo was also from that time. No. Yeah, nineteen sixty uh, four. Yeah. Yep. You also got uh, With Psycho. Jimmy Psycho was nineteen sixty. Yeah. Actually, did you know uh, for the scene in the shower they used that uh, chocolate syrup because it was in black and white? Yes. Yeah. I wrote a small essay and the about most... that movie. Um, I think mm-hmm. how what was my paper about? It was discussing the relationship between the main character and his mother. Man, I forgot what I wrote about, but Alfred Hitchcock, phenomenal, psycho, phenomenal movie. Well shot, well acted. Oh yeah. Uh, there was quite a few. Uh, uh... Uh, Alfred Hitchcock movies I found. Um, uh, by the way, uh, did you know? Uh, I- again, this is purely uh, um, opinionated. Uh, some people believe, some don't. But Alfred Hitchcock uh, actually stayed at that house uh, where Psycho, you know, the big mansion, uh, the night before filming. And he said that his bed was lifted four feet off the floor and dropped. That sounds like. And he saw a... uh, spirits. He, he said it was very haunted. And a lot of people, locals, believed it was. But uh, whether that's true or not, that's again up to the people's opinion. That sounds like such <laughs> but, a Hitchcock uh, thing to do. Yeah, like not even that. Like he's not the. F- first one to do that like you know Stephen uh, King yes um when before he wrote the book The Shining he stayed in that actual hotel where it was filmed and it was haunted and he stayed there and he almost uh according to what he had said I me personally I'm a believer in uh, ghosts some don't uh but he had said that he almost died there Oh my goodness. He saw an a, a man with an axe 
and he said he saw him come right through the bed and start sh strangling him. Oh, he said he could God. feel it. Yeah, like he said, that place was haunted. And so we filmed a movie there with Jack Nicholson. <laughs> and uh, Sh <laughs> Sh Sh Shelley Duvall and I was just like, hmm. And so he took the stories that he had heard about, you know, the haunting there, and he put that into the movie to make the horror movie. So everything that you see in the movie is just from what people have passed down in terms of stories. Uh, yeah, it was a really, really good movie. Um, whether you believe in that sort of stuff or not, that's, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's definitely a good movie if you've seen it. Jack Nicholson's a nut man in that movie. Uh, I know, He's right? Great. Uh, okay. Oh, so you have seen it? Of course. Oh yeah, the remember the? Oh man. Yes. There's a sequel As that was freaking... released. Um, <laughs> I think five years ago. Really? Yeah. Doctor Sleep, starring you and Michael Edgar. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know that. Huh. Yeah. Doctor yeah, Sleep. Doctor Sleep. Yes. Oh, another movie I really want to watch with you. It's really, really good. Uh, it just, when you said Doctor Sleep, it reminded me of that. Um, but I'll finish what I'm going to say about The Shining first. That part where it gets up from the typewriter uh, with Shelley DeVolt standing behind them and starts coming towards her talking about uh, uh, losing concentration, that that was just like, whoa. You know, it's like, man, I just, I don't know. It, it felt like you really, like, remember me telling you uh, just uh, not too long ago about, like, projecting those emotions? Right. He really projected those angry emotions because if you see that scene, it, it looks genuine. Yeah. I know he wasn't actually angry at Shelley Duvall, but he really pushed that, you know, like that those angry emotions. Like he carried it well, I thought. And it's just, um, man, like it's just, I thought it was really, really well portrayed, but yeah, um, and. I don't know. What's your thoughts? I have mixed feelings. It. And so I understand that an actor is expected to portray emotions. I do believe that it is still a job. And uh, don't get me wrong. Realism is great. However, mm -hmm. um, the, the set is still a work environment. And that, oh, yeah. The, this movie of all movies um it 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 was demanding both for Shelley and no it was demanding for Shelley uh Shelley Duvall I do feel that this was one of those things where I feel that yeah there wasn't any acting and when there's not acting it's kind of like okay this is a little bit Mm -hmm. This isn't professional. Like this, it's it's no it's not entertainment when it's when it's real. It's it's weird because you mm -hmm. want it to be real, but when it's not real and it's genuine, and it's like that's I don't know if that's if I find that entertaining, but yeah, because they have that. So in this case, well, well because they have yeah. it well documented, I have mixed feelings about this movie. It's well acted, well produced, and Stanley Kubrick, of course. Well. I don't. It's a good movie, and I'm I'm just gonna leave it at that. But I I oh, feel yeah. I feel you that got mixed feelings about uh, the way the work the work uh, environment. Yeah. Here's another example. Yeah. So The Dark Knight, Heath Ledger, phenomenal role. However, mm -hmm. Heath Ledger, and you could find this video online. Heath Ledger was the was recorded saying that he was the first person to take off his makeup once he got off set and to me i i know there's sources online that say otherwise but to me what that meant was that heath ledger despite still being the joker despite still you know portraying this character of chaos was still professional on the set and treated the actors with respect 
and it's it's still a work environment um people still live in a world of morality that's yeah. i find that commendable behavior to where you can still treat yeah your it's be professional and when the when am i action what's up oh no sorry no no you you were saying i'm just wondering if i'm missing some context no. was there something between jack nicholson and shelly the bull off stage well oh this is such a touchy topic I, cause I, um i just and, don't know anything about it okay I'm sorry <laughs> now you're fine um she went through a lot of and she she just went through a lot of emotional and a, abuse from uh, Kubrick because Kubrick being the perfectionist that he is wanted those genuine emotions from her so he, he was just he was just mean to her Ah, uh, okay. And his demands. That's unfortunate. Yeah, but. I didn't know that. Yeah, but. We huh. have The Shining, and. It is what it is. However, I, w I will say and conclude in, in saying that I, I do f post Dr. Phil, because she showed up on a Dr. Phil episode, mm -hmm. of, I think about a good five years ago. I there Yeah, that's right. Uh, she um she currently resides somewhere in Texas and the people are super protective of her and she still mm -hmm. makes I don't know if she makes small appearances, but she's at peace with herself. The last I checked. So she's at peace with herself, she's doing fine and I'm happy for her. Yeah. But going back to the shining. Yeah. Good movie. I feel like the yeah. workplace could have been a little bit better. A little better. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even Definitely know that. Definitely better. Huh. Oh, but oh yeah, yeah, shining for face value, good movie. Mhm. Mm yeah. My favorite, my favorite part was the two guys in the bedroom. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're fine. Yeah. Uh, man. If you know what I'm talking about, the the bear and the. Okay, so you do know what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I was going to mention a movie I wanted to. You mentioned Doctor Sleep. Um, Ewan McGregor. Doctor Strange. Doctor oh, McGregor. You and McGregor. Oh, you're referring to the movie. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, he's, yeah. Oh yes. Sorry. Go ahead. No, he he was just the actor in Doctor Sleep. Ah yes. Um. Oh, yes, uh, Doctor Strange Love, uh, and how or or how I learned to ah, uh, love the bomb. Another Kubrick classic. You ever seen that one? I have. Yes, nineteen sixty four. Man, that that is a fantastic movie. It is that. Yeah, that man. That is just uh, Slim Pickens. He does an amazing job of Captain uh, Kong. Just. Man, like, and the worst part is, the B twenty nine was set up to be like that, like the emergency kit and all that. Like, man, like it's it's a classic. Hmm. Did you ever see Barry Lyndon? Barry Lyndon. Barry Lyndon. I might have. Uh, do you mind uh, describing a bit of it, uh, just in case? It's a... It, Stanley Kubrick directs it, and I think it takes place mm -hmm. in the 1800s in England, or maybe even earlier. But it is a three-hour long movie, probably longer. It. Okay. And what makes it special is the lighting that was used in this movie. Um... Throughout the film, Kubrick very seldom employs studio lights, so whenever there's an interior scene, there's a candlelight, and it feels like you're there with these people. It's it's kind of like right. um, a f you're following I, – I forgot what it was about, to be honest, but I just remember liking the acting and just following this character, Barry Lyndon, grow. Yeah, and, through the different – yeah. 
Yeah. One of my favorites. Uh, it kind of reminds me of like a. It, I like that where they like portray this. This is kind of cliche to say, but it's like those first person cut scenes of like Call of Duty or whatever. Not saying like a war movie, but it's like you're there kind of thing. That's like you're they're trying to portray you being there in the situation at the time, like in the movie or whatever. Um, I think that's uh, basically what you're getting at, and I've I've seen those in movies um, where they try to make it like you feel like you're there that particular moment um i do like movies like that where they make it very personal like like with you seeming like you're there at that moment kind of thing um i can always uh, i can always appreciate those sort of movies um it's a good one i'm trying to think of a yeah oh yeah it's it's definitely a good one um I'm trying to think of another uh thing um, movies, right. Another uh, movie that's... Uh, actually, you know what? Yeah, I was going to ask. What are your thoughts on silent movies? Silent movies? That is a good question. I feel that the actions from the actors really had to be emphasized because you're living mm-hmm. in a world of no sound. So a lot was left to the audience imagination. Um, I think one of the greatest um, silent actors of all, Charlie Chaplin, did an awesome job in emphasizing not just his facial expressions, but his body language as well in a world where a sound Mm -hmm. just wasn't present. I think Buster Keaton was another um, phenomenal Um, actor who really not not just did body language, but did... stunts that by today's standards I don't think anyone would dare approach with the exception of a few TikTokers who do crazy things but yeah, S- yeah. Silent Era was a phenomenal time it was insane absolutely a- another one that, uh, that you may or may not know that he uh, was from America um, Harold Lloyd are you familiar with him tell me more about Her- Harold Harold Lloyd. Um, okay, so he was uh, in a few good movies um, in the eight, like the nineteen tens into the nineteen twenties, uh, and then he did some talk movies in the thirties. But um, there was one scene, and like it, I'm trying to think of the movie's name. Uh, I have it on DVD, but I'm not going to get up and go look at it. But <laughs> it was one where it was one where he was hanging. It, it was a renowned scene where he has his glasses on and his, you know, those brim straw hats. Yes, like the one that uh, the the one that uh, uh, the Snow Miser wore. Uh, yes. like those. They were really popular in that time period, the 1910s all the way to the 1930s. For men to wear, uh, but he was wearing one of those in the scene, and you see him hanging from the hour hand, looking towards the camera. It, the clock was unwinding, right? And it was, he was actually held uh, by, okay, so across the way there was an actual crane, mm-hmm. and they wanted a realistic thing so that they could just pan down the camera and look to the street below. He was hoisted and held like several hundred feet below the street but they had him secured right under his coat was like a gurney thing and sometimes if you look in the film you can see like the lighting hitting off the uh cable but they tried tried to hide that obviously but he was actually held over the street and one of the scenes that paid the camera pans down to look at the street below uh, and then it was an adjacent roof, which was conveniently near the clock tower. And it was, man, like the stunts that they did back then, like uh, Buster Keaton, you mentioned, um, in the movie The General. You've seen that with the train? I think I may have seen a clip. 
Okay, he was actually laying on the. Okay, you know the the front uh, of the steam locomotives, the uh, front end where it was like the ramp to like clear debris if there was any on the tracks. They would call it the ramp, where it was like a triangle front iron part. He laid on that on a moving locomotive as the as like a camera in front of that was going away from the train as it was rolling forward. He was laying on that for that scene. Wow. Basically, he plays a Union spy in a the Civil War kind of movie, and he's trying to stop the Confederate train from bringing supplies. Uh, and the general, he's sent by the general to stop the train. And in that scene, he's laying there on a moving lo steam locomotive, and another like just close to it the camera on like this wooden platform that was had the metal wheels you know like the things where they would like on one guy on one side and they pump it and it would move down the tracks like you see in the old cartoons it was on one of those platforms the camera and it was just man you know like it's it just insane you, you you couldn't get away with safety standards in movies now doing that. Like, no. just the actor himself. <laughs> like, hmm. Um, You're it, both it just, the actor and the just, stuntman. Yeah, a lot of them were back then. Uh, very few, few of them uh, had step-ins. Uh, and if they had to do a crazy scene either, they had makeshift uh, safety precautions uh or it was like you know just they would have somebody uh like a fake scene where it looks dangerous but it's really not it all depends on the situation the director's protocol back then uh just just mind-boggling um trying to think of uh yeah if if i don't not sure if you ever like watched a silent movie but um at some point you should definitely look into harold Lloyd. he was probably one of the top three him buster keaton and charlie chaplin for sure would be the top three although there were actors that um uh moved on to doing sound films like laurel and hardy but they started in the 1910s, right? Um, the same period of the silent film. Um, the Little Rascals. Uh, they started in the silent era. Uh, Shirley Temple. Uh, she started in the silent era. What then moved into silent Shirley films. Temple. I know, right? Uh, man, she... She was uh, liked by a lot of different uh, movie stars uh, at the time. Like Walt Disney himself handed her, and an, like she, she was yeah, a diplomat uh, later on in life. Yeah, According yeah, to in the eighties, I think. Oh no, she was uh, in the eighties. I think it was South Africa, wherever. I, I, I think it was South Africa, but I could be wrong. Um, that's when she was married. Uh, she she was surely black at that time. Oh. Um, but yeah, she uh, she had quite a few uh, friends in Hollywood. Uh, Walt Disney, uh, Ab uh, Abigail um, Reinhardt. Uh, she flew the plane. I, I'm probably butchering the name. Uh, I'm trying to think of her name. She was a female pilot in the 30s. She uh, was lost uh, in the mountains. I'm trying to think of her name. It's not Amelia Earhart, is it? Is it? Yes, Amelia Earhart. Yeah, she was good friends with her. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, she was also friends with um, Joe DiMaggio, the baseball player. Um, yeah. She and one well time rounded. in the yeah. In the 30s, she actually uh, ran into the Three Stooges, believe it or not, and oh, they wow. actually had a lunch together. Yeah. Um, and it's just... 
she was well-rounded. Uh, and actually, did you know in 1939 she was supposed to play Dorothy in the movie Wizard of Oz? Oh, wow. Who would have known? But, she, yeah, uh, but her uh, producer wouldn't allow her to work for another movie company. She was still under contract with Fox. Yeah. Uh, and Paramount, which Paramount and Fox at the time were combined. They weren't separated yet. And MGM was like, well, could we bore her? No, sorry, she's ours. <laughs> they wouldn't allow it. So Judy Garland got it. Judy Garland. She is ours. Yeah. Wow. Just the lives people live in the... You, the, the, the people know, right? you meet in life and the, play, the places people are born into... It, I know, right? It's incredible. Wow. It's funny because uh, Shirley Temple's dad actually uh, had his tonsils removed so they could have a girl. They had three boys. Huh. Yeah. He was told that, oh, well, if you have your tonsils removed, uh, you could potentially have a son. I mean, a daughter, sorry. His doctor told him that. And ironically, uh, next time they, you know, uh, he had a daughter. Now, whether or not the tonsils played a part, I have no idea, but the doctor <laughs> told him that it would. <laughs> so it was like, uh, they did a good movie portraying her life. It was extremely accurate. Um, it was called, and the person who played Shirley Temple was absolutely amazing. Like, she had to have studied her pretty closely because she sounds like her and looks like her. Wow. Um, it was called The Shirley Temple Story. It was done by Walt Disney uh, Company oh. uh, in the 90s or the 80s. It was either late 80s or early 90s. Really, really good uh, portrayal of her life. Um, another movie, like, they thought, oh, well, once she grows up, nobody's going to want her in a movie. But John Ford, in 1948, asked her to come back to do another movie of, for her. And she was in a John Wayne movie with her, John Wayne, and Henry Fonda. Wow. Yeah. What a cast. Yeah. yeah. I know, right? You're, you're familiar with Henry Fonda? I, I've seen the name. Oh, yeah. A good movie he was in was uh, 12 Angry Men from 1957. I still need to see that. I read the play, but I still need to see the movie. <clears throat> yeah, that... That was a really, really good movie. He he really gets you thinking, like, you know, how thorough is our court system, you know? Like, just just having to, like, really think it over, you know? Like, man, like, he really brings it, like, to light, like, having to really thoroughly think and not just quickly jump to a solution, and like you you see in the movie, like everyone wants to just move on with their day, so they're just gonna, you know, uh, pick any old uh, choice just so that they can move on. But he kind of makes it like you know you're playing with somebody's life here, you know. Absolutely, like you gotta really be sure. Be. Ideally, yeah, yeah. And most juries, like nowadays, they don't let them uh, leave until they are. 100% sure. Oh. And if it's not a majority, uh, then they, like, if it's split and they cannot decide, they call that a hung jury. Because if it's, like, seven and, like, five, they, they call that a hung jury, and that's a mistrial. And they have to grab a new jury. Hmm. And they can see they're all say yes, guilty, or no. They can't have a majority. Right. Because they consider that unfair. Mm -hmm. But, uh. Imagine being yeah. that one guy that just disagrees with everyone. Like, honestly. I know, right? I think the guy is innocent. It's like. No. <sighs> no yeah, I know, I, right? I've, I've never been to jury duty, so I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> oh, man. Actually, imagine funny having enough, to do jury duty. Funny enough, um, 
and it, this mm-hmm. is complicated. I'm not going to give all the details, but on my last week of my apartment lease, I got a letter saying like, hey, come to jury duty. And I was like, it just mm-hmm. had to be the last week of this city that I was living in. And it was, it was a di- know, different right? zip code. So I'm like, so I wrote them a letter. I'm like, hey, in order for me to go, I would have to travel an, uh, an hour to be here. I, I wouldn't be in the city. Plus, I worked in the day. And, but by the end of it, it was kind of like, okay, we, we understand. You're, you're good. We'll, we'll find someone else. But oh, yeah. I, I just thought it was funny how like it, I could have received that letter at any time during while I was in the but, city. But – I moved so I could be closer I to know, work. Right? So, I I, I yeah. thought it was funny. I I turned it down. Oh yeah, yeah. But imagine though, getting all fancy in that suit and tie <laughs> from uh, going to court. Heck yeah! I like... just I, I don't know why, but I just imagine you like when they uh, say the jury's gonna uh, adjourn for uh, you know decision. And just stand up, JoJo pose in the courtroom, <laughs> just right in front of him, just like, oh man, I what don't know why, but I can see you doing it. JoJo pose. <laughs> it's just like, everyone stops and looks at you like, it's like hmm. oh, this guy could have said no. <laughs> yeah, I can see it just like. Ace attorney in the freaking jury room just oh, Yeah. Just <laughs> slamming your fists on the table. Imagine. Well, I think he's gonna get just like a freaking I think he's gonna get an objection <laughs> just slamming the fist on the table, just like yes. Oh no. But yeah. Um I'll be right back to going to talk about okay? Actually, you know what? Um, we could actually end the podcast right here. I think oh, we sure. covered a lot. Um yeah. thank you for your time. Um Yeah, no problem. I really enjoyed this conversation and thank you for telling me about actors and movies and technology and who knows what the future may hold. I think yeah. it's gonna be a very exciting time, so Thank you again yeah, of course. for your time and everything. Hey, no problem. Glad to do it. Come on.